Thank you very much, uh, uh, Eduardo. Thank you very much for all the organizers uh, um, of, of this, uh, as you mentioned, truly international conference. Uh, uh, being on the second day is already a luxury because we could uh, listen to a particularly thought-provoking uh, uh, keynote yesterday and some interventions that uh, opened the door for what we will be looking at today. And I'm particularly honored uh, to, to share the, the panel today, actually to chair the panel today, and I will try to be as uh, <laughs> moderating and not intervening too much as possible. Uh, but I, we have two stellar, literally stellar uh, panelists. Um, Dr. Rainer Hule, uh, who has mentioned, has been a member of the Committee on Enforced Disappearance, uh, and uh, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Luciano San, who is currently the chairperson of the working group on enforced uh, or involuntary disappearances, but has been, uh, let's disclose the past, as well a member of the Committee on Enforced Disappearance. I changed the order because uh, we discussed among us uh, and we will be following this order in our uh, dialogue, as we in fact uh, decided to have some introductions at the beginning and to rather use our time uh, um, going through a number of uh, particularly uh, tense issues uh, in a relationship. Yesterday, Professor uh, De Fourville told us uh, an interesting story of two gentlemen uh, who met uh, somewhere. Today, I guess we will be listening uh, to the story of maybe two ladies or two twins who met somewhere, investigation and search. Um, there is tension among these two ladies. Uh, sometimes we even wonder whether they are the same, whether they are so twins uh, that we can get confused and we don't know which one is the other. Sometimes they do have to cooperate because they are clearly two different persons. And this is a crucial aspect uh, when we want to tackle enforced disappearance. Enforced disappearance, uh, um, we will look at it from the legal viewpoint, of course, uh, but from the human viewpoint uh, is, uh, is made of questions. Who, when, where, what? And investigating and searching uh, precisely pursue the aim to answer to those questions. Uh, Yesterday, we listened to uh, Professor Frey, who somehow introduced already the idea that we have two pillars uh, that in fact may even overlap. On the one hand, investigation, and on the other hand, search. And I noted down some key words, uh, priority, choice, need or right, obligation, coordination. Um, these words, uh, are the perimeter of this difficult relationship. Because of course there is a relationship and we have to answer to those questions, uh, finding a way out of this, uh, uh, of this maze. On the one hand, uh, we don't know, and sometimes uh, using the word priority may be slightly misleading. Who has to make that choice? Do we have to make a choice? How do we establish a fair balance uh, in order to provide answers? Now, I will tell you a secret, uh, which I hope has not uh, been heard yet by the two gentlemen, uh, E.D. Rome and E.D. Geneva. But our friends here, the panelists, uh, within their respective uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, have already looked deeply into the issues. Uh, and have come out uh, with some very interesting tools uh, to spell out uh, and to provide answers to those questions. On the one hand, the Committee on Enforced Disappearance in 2019 adopted guidelines for the search for disappeared persons. And later on, the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances published, <coughs> sorry, in September 2020, um, a report on the best practices to invest and policies to investigate enforced disappearance. As I said, I hope the two gentlemen don't know this uh, because these two studies uh, provide some interesting answers uh, and uh, a way out uh, uh, from our uh, dilemma and, and some interesting uh, ways to tackle impunity. 
I guess we should therefore listen to Rainer first, uh, who can introduce us, uh, first of all, how the committee decided uh, to come up with these guidelines, uh, whether they thought or why did they think that it was a useful or a necessary exercise. Uh, and I will throw an additional answer because yesterday it remained a bit floating. Is the search an obligation? I have my own answer, but I'd love to hear it from you. And if it is an obligation, is there an individual right to be searched for? Do the principles uh, contribute to an answer to that question? And later we will listen to Luciano, who will give us uh, the story of the other lady, the investigation, and tell us some insights uh, on how this can be as effective as possible. Raina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriela, and also thank you to the organizers. It is it's always a pleasure to be here in Nuremberg to speak about uh, these important issues. Um, it's a very interesting concept, uh, Gabriela, that you are proposing in gender terms uh, about investigation and search. I'd never really thought about it, but I will take that with me uh, from that uh, conference without doubt. Um, yeah, let me start with your last uh, question. Is there a right uh, to be searched and a duty to search uh, for the disappeared? This is exactly the question we had been discussing in the committee. Uh, and which finally led to the guiding principles on the search. Because uh, I, of course, had always parted from the idea that there is this, this right and there is this duty uh, to search. But uh, when you look at the convention, it uh, becomes a bit more complicated. In the convention, we have this famous Article 12, which is about investigation, the duty to investigate, very clearly spelled out in many, in many details. But uh, you never really know what is in, meant by investigation. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever you uh, want to uh, call it, it is a bit ambiguous, the, uh, the term uh, investigation. So my interpretation I wanted to propose always is that this term investigation must include the search, but uh, the article is not very express uh, on that. But on the other hand, we have this wonderful article 24 in the convention, which uh, establishes a series of basic rights of the victims of enforced disappearance um, for those who have the convention not uh, present, a uh, victim in the sense of this convention includes the families and other persons directly affected uh, by a disappearance. So these persons, these victims have a series of rights and one of them is in paragraph three of that article, the right to be, uh, the, uh, the right that is a state uh, search for the disappeared persons. So there is a, a right uh, to be searched and a right to search or a duty to search in the convention, but we felt it must be clearly uh, spelled out. And uh, one of the reasons why we thought that was that in the, uh, in the dialogues we had with many states about uh, finding uh, disappeared persons, which is one of the competences the committee has, uh, there were so many dif uh, difficulties and deficiencies uh, to be noticed uh, by everybody, not only by the committee, that finally uh, the idea uh, came out that we should uh, state this right to be searched and the right to search in very clear terms. Now, it's nothing new. Uh, I have to, to insist on that. And we insisted in the committee that we do not invent a new right. Uh, we just uh, spell out what is already in international right in the convention, but even uh, before. The Inter-American Court has, had a, has uh, a very rich jurisprudence on the right uh, to be searched by disappeared persons. Uh, and it was present, as we heard yesterday from, uh, from our friend uh, Emilio Grenzel, it was uh, key to the first uh, truth commission in Argentina the, uh, that produced the report Nunca Mas. Uh, 
And uh, more than that, it is also in three very important international documents that we spell out in the uh, preface uh, to the principles. That is uh, the uh, document, uh, the, the so-called uh, Journée principles against impunity, the principles of the rights of victims for reparation and other rights, uh, the Van Boven principles, and uh, the, the principles uh, explained to us yesterday by Barbara Frey, the Minnesota Protocol, which is cur uh, normally considered a protocol on uh, extrajudicial killings, but it includes uh, enforced uh, disappearance, as Barbara rightly uh, insisted. So these, uh, these principles we all mention as a reference, as starting points in the preface uh, to the guiding principles. Um, I'm not sure, Gabriela, should I explain some of the principles right now, or will you come back later to that? No, if you can explain already and okay. introduce okay. already the principles, uh, and yeah. afterwards okay. uh, we'll look okay. more to the study. Okay, so we started in, in 2015 when Luciano was still a member, and, and uh, especially also a member of this internal working group of the committee uh, uh, that drafted the ideas for what would in 2019 finally become uh, the guiding principles. We started establishing uh, first uh, these rights as rights, and then uh, finally uh, came out in a three years process with many, many dialogues with many people all over the world. Gabriela was one of our counterparts in that process. We, we finally adopted in 2019 uh, these uh, principles in the April uh, session. There are 16 uh, principles and I'm not boring you with uh, spelling them out now. They are on the internet very easily in the UN la languages available. I want uh, j just uh, perhaps um, pick out uh, a few of them. The principle three, demands a comprehensive public policy for the search of uh, disappeared uh, people. That means it is not sufficient to have a authority, somebody who is uh, charged with the search of these people. This must be part of a inclusive, comprehensive state policy for really uh, finding uh, the disappeared persons, and this must be part, of course, of a policy of preventing uh, uh, disappearances. Another principle, principle number five, also uh, very important, uh, refers to the right to participate in the search for victims, and victims in that broader sense, which I explained. This, of course, is not only a right uh, in the search, it's also a right in the investigation, as we will hear from uh, Luciano, but it is a, a principle that permeates the whole uh, Convention on Enforced Disappearance and the whole idea of combating uh, enforced disappearance. You can't do it without the affected people, the victims. Third principle I want to highlight is uh, that we repeat what is true for investigation, it must also be true for the search, that is, that it is a continuous obligation. It cannot just uh, begin and then when it becomes difficult, uh, authorities uh, just uh, step aside and leave it to the victims to continue uh, the, the search. Principle eight, uh, the leads us to the topic in a narrower sense of this uh, panel. Uh, there we speak of uh, the need for a comprehensive search strategy. And of course, this comprehensive search strategy must include uh, what prosecutors uh, do, what the criminal investigation authorities in a country that have the duty to investigate the, the perpetrators of the enforced disappearance do. These things cannot be separated, but unfortunately, many times they are separated. Uh, and uh, one tool to reach this uh, can be that uh, the whole work of uh, searching for the disappeared is guided by transparent public protocols so that uh, society and especially victims can follow up what 
uh, the authorities are really doing, because many times they uh, they walk around in the dark. They don't know what the authorities do. After three years, they get a report. Yes, we continued searching. Unfortunately, we didn't find uh, your family. And that's it. Uh, that is uh, not uh, coherent with uh, principle 16 that uh, calls for a transparent uh, public uh, protocol uh, for research. So, and principle 13 now, this is what really leads us uh, to uh, Luciana's part here in, in this uh, panel, where we uh, make a clear call for the coordination between investigators in a criminal sense and searchers in what sometimes is, from my view, falsely called humanitarian sense, because it is more than humanitarian. As I try to tell you, it is a legal obligation uh, and therefore it is a legal tool. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I make a stop here and uh, we will certainly uh, go deeper into this difficult uh, relationship of the two ladies. Thank you very much, uh, Heine. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, this is a perfect uh, introduction of uh, a very rich, uh, uh, although brief, uh, concise, uh, but very precise document. Uh, uh, those guidelines touch upon uh, many delicate uh, issues and intentions. Before and to actually give the floor to Luciano, I will quote uh, a very short uh, uh, paragraph uh, from a judgment of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. As you referred, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, uh, since if not the, the earlier case, but uh, uh, its early jurisprudence on enforced disappearance, uh, had to look into this potential tension, but nevertheless uh, inextricable relationship. In fact, it says, the investigation in cases of enforced disappearances must have certain specific connotations that arise from the nature and complexity of the phenomenon investigated. In other words, the investigation must also include all the actions required to determine the fate of the victim and his or her whereabouts. Meaning that here our two ladies or twins are definitely in the same pair of shoes. Uh, investigation must take this into account. Uh, Luciano, can, can you please tell us what led the working group uh, uh, to the drafting uh, of such a comprehensive report uh, and what are the main uh, findings and conclusions uh, in the report, please? Thank you very much, Gabriela. Uh, and thanks uh, to the organizers, to the International Nuremberg Principals Academy and to the Center for Human Rights. It's a real honor and pleasure, especially uh, to share this panel with, with Rainer and, and with Gabriela. So I, I will talk about impunity. Uh, first of all, just uh, to, to, to clarify, I am not the, the, the chairperson of the working group uh, anymore since uh, September. Uh, so that's uh, just to, to be fair. Uh, so as I was saying, I, I will talk about impunity. And impunity for enforced disappearances has been uh, an issue uh, of constant discussion. The, actually, the, the working group uh, worked on, on the issue in its uh, 1993 annual report after a public consultation in 1992. But even before that, as you know, impunity is an issue completely related to enforced disappearances. Um, to draw the context, it should be mentioned, as you were noting uh, before, of course, the Minnesota Protocol a few years before, and of course, also the, the Schwanet principles uh, later updated in 2005, also deal with, with criminal investigations. So 27 years later, uh, the working group decided to return to the issue of impunity, uh, as, as you uh, have presented in its last uh, thematic report, convinced that uh, there are states uh, willing to investigate in for disappearances, but are require assistance in dealing uh, with uh, with different forms of, of impunity. Uh, 
I uh, need to, to say uh, that uh, this report was uh, adopted also as a complement to the guiding principles presented uh, by Reiner right, right, right now, uh, developed by, by, by the committee. Uh, you will find in, in the thematic report uh, a lot of uh, citations of the, of the principles. So that was the, the idea to try to read both, um, both the, uh, tools uh, together. That, that is the idea. So that is why it is so important uh, to present uh, both, uh, both reports or the principles and the report uh, together uh, this time. So uh, that, that is the, the formal rationale of the report of the working group, but behind that rationale, the main goal is to put the issue of impunity again in focus. So beyond the, the value of justice, it, it, it seems increasingly evident that in those countries where no serious progress has been made in investigating and punishing uh, those responsible, disappearances of uh, other serious human rights violations have not been stopped. So one idea that I, that I want to, to make uh, clear is that impunity could be seen as a guarantee for repetition. So as long as impunity prevails, it seems very difficult to reform from the roots those state institutions that commit or participate in for disappearances which uh, would be the real solution to stop this crime. So uh, behind the, the, the convention, behind uh, all uh, jurisprudence and the development of, in, uh, of uh, international human rights law, there is a need to a very important uh, reform in state institutions police institutions, military institutions, and we usually don't talk about this. Uh, we usually, uh, from the UN uh, mechanisms, we sometimes criticize uh, reforms that goes uh, usually to the other way. But uh, I think that there is a need to get involved in, in, in the need of uh, reform, especially to the security agencies in, in the States. Uh, and uh, when, I, I, when I talk about that, I, I be, I'm thinking on security uh, forces, armed forces, and intelligence agencies. So this often claimed dichotomy of truth or justice or search versus criminal investigations appears to be, in my view, uh, mere fantasy, uh, since both are, in fact, closely links, as we are saying, they are uh, in a way uh, sisters. So I will come back uh, to, to these issues in, in, in a few minutes. So impunity was, of course, the consequence of the huge failure of criminal systems uh, when uh, intervening uh, in cases of for disappearances. So this is another uh, main idea that I want to draw. So uh, we are talking about the failure of the criminal justice systems. Why the, 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 the criminal justice systems ha have failed? Uh, in some contexts, this has been due to legal and mainly political obstacles, such as the proliferation of amnesties, pardons, the use of status of limitations or exemptions from due process. Uh, so that is why the report in its first part tries to deal with that. It's not, uh, of course, um, very original, but uh, uh, the group felt that it was important because these kind of uh, issues are still uh, happening in, in, in many countries in the world to again establish uh, the rules against uh, the obstacles for uh, investigation and prosecution and, of course, sanction of enforced disappearances. Uh, in, in other contexts, the, the failings are caused by the so-called de facto impunity uh, that results from the lack of independence uh, of officials in charge of the investigation, political pressure, threats, harassments of, of judges, prosecutors, 
or even the murder or disappearance of witnesses, activists and family members. Uh, we uh, have a lot of very sad examples of family members disappeared while uh, searching for the loved ones. So uh, other uh, issues related to the, the fact of impunity are the destruction of evidence, uh, the conduct of fraudulent investigations, uh, or of course, always there, the lack of resources. Uh, so these failings are also product of the uh, inability of penal system to investigate crimes committed by the state itself. So that is what for his appearances is is a, a state crime that by definition carries impunity. So this is particularly the case in those countries where uh, the weakness of state institutions allow, uh, allows for uh, large scale disappearances. So you will find that uh, these uh, things are also related. Um, in fact, uh, the two constitutive those uh, two of the, of the constitutive elements of enforced appearances as provided for in Article 2 of the Convention, uh, so the involvement of state official and the concealment of the victims were about, create context, uh, context that make uh, accountability very, very difficult. So, um, in addition, these uh, criminal systems are generally designed to prosecute very simple crimes, such as uh, crimes against the property or those committed, committed by people who are vulnerable to, to the state's own punitive power. So these systems are not uh, uh, created, have not, ha have not the capacity to address complex crimes uh, committed by the military, security, or intelligence authorities. Uh, many times with the, with the knowledge and the, under the order of the political uh, leaders of the state. So another point I want to raise is that the, this failure of the penal system then led to the failure of the searches as the criminal justice was in charge of it. So this is uh, the origin of, of the problem in, in a way. So... Uh, Judicial systems often lack the technical and human capacities to conduct searches for persons that were disappeared with the involvement of the state, uh, having uh, mostly lawyers in their teams. So uh, what the report uh, tries to show is that uh, is the obstacles uh, usually faced uh, by uh, those who want to uh, effectively investigate and try to find some uh, ways to get out of, of, of this problem. So, of course, this context, uh, very uh, sad, uh, is aggravated, of course, by the passage of time. So this is the perfect scenario to promote the extortionate idea that family members should, should choose between the search for their loved ones and to obtain justice. So this idea widespread all, all around the world states, if you want truth, you if you want to know where your loved one uh, is, then forget about prosecution and the perpetrators will bring information. So this idea, as you know, I'm, I, I, I am Argentine and I live in Argentina. This idea failed uh, when the amnesty laws were enacted or even uh, the, per the pardons uh, to those uh, convicted uh, were enacted. Uh, none of the perpetrators spoke, with the exception of a few, maybe Silingo is the, is the better known, uh, who revealed some details of the, of the dead flights. And, and that uh, happened in, in many uh, parts of the world, I think. Colombia maybe could be an interesting scenario nowadays, uh, where there are incentives for, for the accused to provide information in exchange um, uh, of uh, some kind of, um, uh, yeah, to uh, some kind of uh, benefits uh, in, in the sanction. Uh, but we may talk about this uh, later. Uh, even the jurisdiction for the peace do not establish impunity. Um, so this development is nothing less than the naturalization of the conditions that triggers impunity, both the URE and the factor. So this is the, the field in which the new paradigm 
emerges. What is the new paradigm? Uh, the, the the paradigm uh, in in these uh, recent years uh, is that the different countries have developed non-judicial humanitarian, and now uh, the, the 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 word uh, that uh, Reiner was uh, was contesting, and I agree uh, with uh, with his opinion. Um, so this non-judicial institution for the purpose of searching for the disappeared. So this common sense, it appears now as a common sense in public, policy, in public policies in this area has been materializing as a response to the failure of the, of the penal system. So I think that the, the debate that uh, we deserve uh, should denaturalize or deconstruct this common sense and we should always, while thinking public policies, remember how we got here. In a way, while bringing back the issue of impunity, uh, the report tries to help to break the idea that criminal investigations are incompatible with the search of the disappeared. And at the same time, it argues that a thorough and independent criminal investigation will collect information that is crucial for the search. In this uh, sense, experience show that both uh, need to uh, respectively provide feedback one to each other. So the information produced uh, regarding the, perpetrat the perpetrators is always val valuable in guiding the search. Uh, for example, if the modus operandi to conceal, to conceal the disappeared uh, person uh, used in a given context and by a group of perpetrators is known, then it is essential to move forward uh, in the investigation of the perpetrator. On the other hand, finding the disappeared person is also determining, uh, a determining factor in advancing in the establishment of the responsibility of the perpetrator. So if the, if the victim is found alive, that testimony will be the best evidence to reconstruct the facts uh, and of course then to, to use it for prosecution. If the body is found, the place of disposal and the result of the autopsy or forensic anthropology uh, studies are uh, also often uh, a key. It is always uh, in my mind the case, the case of uh, the daughter of Estela Carlotto, whose body, as you may know, was found months after her disappearance and after she gave birth of her son. And in the autopsy, it was confirmed that she gave birth, so the search of Estela's grandson began. Then the testimony of a survivor of the same clandestine detention facility also brought details on the birth of the child. So, of course, it is of uh, most relevance to organize the investigations, taking into consideration the context and to join related cases. And the report also tries to argue in, in, in this sense. So, uh, I think I, I need to make a clarification uh, now uh, all of this doesn't mean that I am against the separation of search and criminal investigations. Actually, I am strongly for it. But of course, the challenge is then to coordinate both and we will probably take uh, talk later about, about it. So the point is that uh, with impunity, it is very difficult to be successful in the search. If the part of the, st of the state that investigates and prosecutes do not show its teeth uh, then uh, the other part of the state, the institutions involved in the disappearances, will not have the incentive to provide information. So this is very important. Uh, we should learn from from, uh, from criminology, uh, uh, especially those studies related to state crimes, uh, to, to think about uh, possible solutions uh, to the issue of enforced disappearances. So is this, uh, if the search uh, will be all on the burden of the families and investigators, what is the need to guarantee impunity? Uh, so uh, again, uh, a point is with impunity, uh, the practice of disappearing, of disappearing people will continue because uh, this crime, as we know, is a very powerful policy to create fear and discipline, uh, discipline part of, of a society and uh, also many times to facilitate illegal uh, businesses. So uh, to finish this part of the, intervention, the, of the intervention, I just want to, to add that the report deals with other policies that 
other policies that are needed to efficient investigations to deal with the obstacles that uh, investigations usually face. For instance, the protection uh, of witnesses uh, to deal with the prosecution uh, of uh, of those involved in the, in the investigation and a protection of witnesses that uh, should not be uh, the same that in other criminal cases or for other kind of crimes, especially in, in, in the case of family members, the, 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 the need that they have to be involved in the search, uh, uh, it's uh, very important to, to have in mind uh, so the, the state cannot just uh, change their identity and move them to, to other city. Uh, other uh, important uh, policy that is recommended by, by the working group in, in, in this report is the opening of uh, intelligence and reserve archives and the study of them by specialized teams, because it's not just to open the archives uh, and de declassify them, but also to work on them that usually is a, a very specialized and complicated issue. Of course, the psychosocial support of, uh, for victims because, of course, it's the right, but also because usually uh, the families, the victims, uh, the friends of the disappeared are sources uh, of very important information. So, uh, of course, the, the, the report also deals with the obligation of the state, the, of those in charge of the investigations to um, uh, inform continuously uh, about the, the, the investigation to, to, to the families, uh, but they are also a, a very important uh, source uh, for investigation. Uh, another issue, and I am uh, finishing by now, the use of new technologies for investigations. So the link between those in charge to investigate and scientists is crucial. And there are, of course, experiences on that. International cooperation is a, a very big issue. Uh, and um, uh, finally, uh, to create the proceedings to allow that the investigations, both for the search and for prosecution, uh, begin immediately. So this is, of course, a key issue. Uh, and in those first hours after disappearance, I think uh, that it is when the, the split or the separation of both uh, investigation and search uh, would be a complete uh, mistake. Thank you very much. I, I stop here by now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luciano. I, I could not avoid thinking that had uh, ED Rome and ED Geneva been listening to your presentation, they would have been awfully, awfully worried uh, because I guess they are the biggest fans of impunity. Uh, and I do agree with you that impunity is both a root cause, uh, uh, but also what fuels uh, um, the impossibility to, to move forward. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a sentence in one of the paragraphs of the study of the working group, which I would like to recall, that for me beautifully captures uh, uh, the importance of the struggle against impunity. Impunity can have a multiplying effect, uh, which causes additional suffering and anguish to the victims and their families. We do have to bear in mind uh, uh, that we have the power through struggle against impunity to put an end to that suffering, and that should be our first uh, aim. A technical um, uh, thing, uh, I, I see that now you are starting to use the, the function of questions and answers, and I encourage all participants and, and public uh, who would like to do so to uh, to send questions through that. We received already a comment uh, uh, and questions, uh, which I will try to convey now, adding them to my own questions. So Raina and, and Luciano, you might have uh, uh, quite some um, important uh, reactions to give. Listening to both of you and reading the two documents, uh, I cannot uh, avoid noticing that uh, you use precisely the same reference. Uh, search and investigation, admitting that they are entrusted to two separate entities or institutions, uh, nevertheless, they have to be mutually reinforcing. This is what, this is the wording we have in the guiding principle 13 paragraph one. This is the wording we have in paragraph 56 of the study. So let's take that as our starting point. Nevertheless, if we go back to what we have been listening to even yesterday, um, there is this tension. 
between coordination, okay, if they have to mutually reinforce each other, how can this be achieved? What are the main challenges? Yesterday, Anna Lorena in her intervention in the afternoon repeatedly say, it is important, it is crucial, but it is awfully challenging. So uh, if you can shed some light on that, that would be more than welcome. And on this, I would mention, and this was one of the comments, uh, uh, that there is a study by the NGO Swiss Peace that is about to be published uh, that precisely reflects upon uh, the challenges and how uh, they can be addressed uh, in coordination between investigation and the search. But another thing that keeps uh, uh, floating in my mind uh, is what was mentioned yesterday by Professor Frey, uh, and uh, today it came up again. Priorities. So I, I would love to hear your, um, your impression on that. Uh, priorities, prioritization, how can that be achieved uh, without creating damages? And on this, uh, and I would leave the floor to you to answer, I would like to quote again a very brief passage, uh, this time from the European Court of Human Rights in a rather famous judgment uh, that is Turkey. Where these appearances and lying stances are concerned, the procedural obligation to investigate can hardly come to an end on discovery of the body or the presumption of death. This merely casts light on one aspect of the fate of the missing person. An obligation to account for the disappearance and death uh, and to identify and prosecute any perpetrator of unlawful acts in that connection will generally remain. So even if we were to prioritize uh, we are still dealing with these two, two aspects that cannot be detached one from the other. So I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that and how can we preserve this dual relationship without prejudice of one uh, side to the other. Finally, the question was whether you can share some, uh, we received from the public, whether you can share some good practices. Uh, I, I, I guess it's a very pertinent question and we, we always uh, enjoy listening to uh, positive re uh, stories instead of only negative stories. And finally, this is my question. You mentioned evidences. This is one of, of the areas where indeed we can have tensions. So if we prioritize and we say for the sakes of uh, going humanitarian, as, uh, as uh, Rainer said, uh, this is a slippery notion here, but let's go and prioritize the search first. But what we are collecting in the search in terms of testimony, evidences, uh, can eventually be a proof and an, a, an evidence uh, during a criminal trial. How do we balance this? How do we guarantee that uh, we, we keep uh, the two guarantees on the plate? Rainer, the floor is yours to start answering and then Luciano, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gabriela. Well, that's really all the questions almost in one. Um, uh, let me try to, to systematize this uh, a little bit. Um, we have now already jumped into the situation that we find uh, in a series of countries that the task, the legal obligation, and I repeat that all the time, of uh, searching is no longer primarily in the hands of the prosecutors, of the fiscalia, or whatever it's called in different uh, countries, but in a special institution, a extrajudicial institution, a extraordinary institution that is not part of the normal institutional system of uh, pre procuring justice in the country. And uh, this is not normal. This is extraordinary. This is an invention, uh, as Luciani has, has told us rightly, that has uh, is of more recent dates, uh, and uh, it can be interpreted uh, in bad faith as an intent of the state, or especially of the judicial system, to get rid of this task of searching. But I would rather 
historically looking at it, I see it as a result mainly of the pressure of the victims, of the families that, but this pressure, where does it come from? It comes from the failure of the prosecutors to correctly include the search into their strategies, right? So we have, uh, if I may go a bit in details, I think it's worthwhile here. Uh, we have now uh, in Latin America, which is the part I overlook best, there are some more in other parts, but these are the, the, the mostly under study. We have uh, four of such uh, search uh, commissions that are not part of the judiciary. That is Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and El Salvador. Uh, and actually, I might add that I'm currently participating in a study on these four uh, search uh, uh, commissions. So the first question is, why did they uh, come about? And if you look at it, in th three of these, Colombia, Peru, and El Salvador, are a product of transitional justice processes. So they were created uh, many years after a peace accord or uh, the, uh, in the case of, of Peru, the end of the dictatorship, under the impression of the failure of giving results uh, in the search uh, by the judiciary, by the prosecutors. So they are part of a post-transitional uh, endeavor. Mexico is a bit different because there was no transition and because the Mexican Commission has, different from the others, a mandate that includes fresh ongoing uh, disappearances, which the others don't have. Colombia, uh, Peru and El Salvador have a, a mandate only looking into the past disappearances during the, the years of uh, extreme uh, violence. So. In these cases, uh, there is no, uh, no decision uh, about uh, priorities. Uh, there is the uh, commission that has the task of uh, investigating the, uh, the location uh, of the disappeared, and there is the prosecutor who has the, uh, the task uh, primarily uh, to look into the perpetrator, finding the perpetrator. Of course, this is this should not be the, the case. They should not be left out of their duty to, to investigate also the, uh, the uh, location of the disappeared persons. But the problem that, that we have seen and that really gave rise to these uh, extraordinary commissions is the, the fact that they don't do it. And there are many reasons, and I'm not going into that because Luciana is probably more competent to give us a, a, a closer look into why prosecutors are not really so much interested in finding the disappeared. Uh, I'm not going into detail, but it is a fact. And, and that, leads, uh, that, that leads to this uh, uh, separation. So what we are trying to find out is, is there really an advantage in creating these extraordinary uh, commissions? There are advantages in the sense that this is an institution exclusively concentrated in finding uh, the disappeared. They have no other task. Uh, they have not the task to find evidence uh, that leads to the perpetrator. Uh, they have not an evidence, uh, not another task like a huge uh, truth commission, for example, to give a panorama of all the circumstances that led uh, to, the, uh, to the massive disappearances. They're really uh, concentrated, and that is an, uh, is an advantage. Uh, and that's why, uh, why families uh, wish uh, this as a central uh, task for one specific, uh, ex uh, specific institution, and that's the great expectation. So far, we could not say that uh, this expectation has been really met to a uh, large degree. And anyway, the Disadvantage, the, the problem for these uh, extrajudicial uh, commissions is that they depend so much on the work and on the competences, the mandates of the criminal investigation institution, the prosecutor. In some countries, it's the investiga investigative judge, but mostly it's the prosecutor. Uh, so 
And there's, of course, rivalry. Uh, they don't uh, want to share competences sometimes uh, or many, many times. And in any way, if a uh, commissioner uh, of, of such an extraordinary commission wants to make, let's say, an exhumation, he normally needs the accompaniment or at least uh, the allowance of the prosecutor because that is a, a legal competence of the judicial uh, system. The same if if they suspect that the dead uh, bodies of disappeared are in a private property um, or in some uh, military institution, uh, they cannot go there uh, without uh, the allowance uh, and mostly the, uh, co the company of the prosecutor's office. So there is this extreme need of cooperation and and the uh, uh, only under very uh, happy circumstances, uh, we can see that this really works uh, finely. You asked me for a positive aspect. Uh, I would say that uh, for so far as we can judge it at this moment, May 2021, Colombia can be in many aspects a positive uh, example. Colombia, after the peace accord, created a system for, uh, for investigating and finding the truth uh, about uh, the crimes during uh, during the years of uh, civil war. They created basically three institutions, a truth commission, a special jurisdiction for peace, uh, that is an, a judicial organ, and a, a commission uh, for the search of uh, the disappeared uh, people. Separate institutions, again, but under the roof of one system and the, the law that creates the system makes clear, clear rules for cooperation between these. Now, rules as we see, this exists in Mexico too, but we can see in Mexico, it's, it's the other way, uh, the cleavage between the commission and the, uh, and the uh, prosecutor seems every month uh, bigger, uh, it, it, not so in, in Colombia. In Colombia, uh, le since last year, the three, but especially the, the commission for the search and the, the special prosecutors, the special jurisdiction for peace, have created common commissions. They join their competences and their resources and their different uh, professional experiences in common missions so they go to certain uh, territories. The special jurisdictions clears the field. They guarantee the access. They guarantee that everybody can be interrogated who might have uh, some information, that part of the, the uh, search commission puts in their knowledge uh, from uh, especially the victims, the information they have where the bodies might uh, to be found so that if that works out, if that is not destroyed by political decisions, because all this whole system suffers under uh, by political pressure, or by uh, jealousies uh, between the different organs, it can really be an example uh, for uh, the cooperation between these two uh, aspects. So uh, the picture is uh, different and as uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree with Luciano in that I'm clearly in favor of the uh, commissions. They are an interesting model. But, it, but uh, there are another way to resolve the problem is to restructure uh, uh, prosecutors' offices and make very clear from the legislator that your task is to investigate the criminal aspect and to find uh, the disappeared. And you cannot prioritize between, between these two aspects. Both are your legal duties on the same level. So that, but this is, uh, if you look at the practice of uh, these prosecutors in many countries, it is it, a gigantic task. You would have, to, the, the great advantage that Colombia has now is that the three that are completely new institutions with new personnel, with personnel dedicated to their task and not ridden by the old uh, failures of, of decades of 
bad traditions in, in those institutions. So that makes it possible that this kind of uh, cooperation. So it depends on so many uh, uh, variables uh, that for me it's difficult to say one is better than the other, but at the moment we should support and, and promote uh, this model where it exists at best uh, we can. Thank, thank you very much, Rainer. Luciano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Very, very interesting, especially listening to, to Rainer and, and your questions, uh, Gabriela. Uh, very complicated. I will try to, to answer a few. Uh, for sure, I will uh, lost uh, others, so please uh, come back uh, with that. But I, I would like to, to begin uh, thinking about the issue of priorities. And uh, I think, in a way, I advance my, my opinion on that. I think uh, priority, the issue of priorities are, are a trap, in a way. And um, I think that the answer is that we should think uh, about these problems in uh, thinking on the, the, the functioning of bureaucracies. I think that uh, that's uh, one issue. And... Um, and, and that's why uh, I, uh, I support the idea of uh, this new um, uh, non-judicial agencies for, for the search. Uh, wh what uh, do I mean uh, with, uh, with this, with the idea of uh, the functioning of, of bureaucracies? When both the, um, invest the criminal investigation, the prosecution and, and the search uh, were uh, on the on the hands of, of the criminal justice system, uh, there, uh, these, uh, um, uh, these uh, offices, the prosecution offices, sometimes in charge of judges, sometimes in charge of prosecutors, depending on, on each country, usually uh, were, of course, the, the first thing is that, uh, as I said before, and, and the reports take care of, uh, takes care of, of it, there, I mean, these are complex crimes, state crimes. So uh, the, the, the first problem is that uh, there are no ability to, uh, to deal with, with, with these issues. So the second issue is that as they don't have the ability, usually they tend to say we are full of work. So we have another very important issues to deal with. Uh, we have... Uh, the, the trafficking on drugs, uh, well, but many even uh, complex crimes. So that is why it is also important and, um, and the working group uh, uh, took care of, of it in, in the report is the specialization even of the offices of the, of the prosecutors. Because in, in, uh, what I want to say is that it is really important to um, to have these different state uh, units in one side or the other side uh, being accountable for it. So uh, when everything was in charge of, of, the, of the prosecutors, they, they used to say, uh, I, I will give you something. So th th that is what, what you find. So many times they uh, advance in the prosecution of uh, one perpetrators, usually maybe sometimes uh, the the head of uh, of of one I, I don't know for example of a military area using for example the um, the 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 theories of the responsibility of the superiors in the dif in their different uh, ways and in a way that and, and it could be also seen as a good practice uh, answering the, the question of good practices to open the door of, of, uh, for prosecution, because uh, this kind of uh, uses of the criminal law in a way changes the, the, the complexity of investigations on enforced appearances to a quite simple investigation, because what you need to prove is that the disappearances occurred, of course, and that the commander on those in charge of uh, responsible for that were uh, of course, in, in charge of, of, of all the operations. So you don't need to prove every, every uh, disappearances. So this is a good practice to, to open the door 
and to show and to show this, uh, as I was saying. But at the same time, uh, when the prosecutors usually uh, give to the victims uh, these kind of responses, then they feel in a way better to abandon the searches, something that they do not know how to do. So in, in my view, separating responsibilities in a way creates uh, separate at the same time um, uh, organizations that are accounted for. So what will the victims, I mean, a, a search unit, the only thing that they will be able to show is finding disappeared persons. So they will not be able to, to, to tell you we are working on the prosecution or see, uh, we have uh, uh, indicted one, one person. I mean, they need to find disappear persons. And the prosecutors, they will have to say, and, and, spe and especially when you have uh, specialized units, they will have to show the victims, the, the states, the public, we have prepared this case. We are uh, uh, sending this to the to the trial judge. We advance in this. So separating responsibilities, I think, is is a, a, a good option. Always thinking where we are coming from. We are coming from very weak judicial systems, very weak states. Usually, when uh, for disappearances occur in these uh, massive ways, so. I think that uh, that is why I, I am uh, for this kind of separation of responsibilities. But of course, it brings the issue of coordination. That was other uh, question or uh, I mean, I think that the question was about the challenges that brings coordination when you are separating all these efforts. Uh, I, I can stop here and, and maybe uh, uh, ask you, Gabriel, to, to choose with uh, which issue should we continue? Well, choosing is difficult in particular <laughs> since there are more questions coming. So, uh, and uh, we have uh, 10 minutes left. So what I will try to do um, is to summarize what, uh, what uh, we have uh, in the uh, in the questions uh, and maybe to give you a final uh, final question on, on which we can try to, to wrap up. Um, most of the questions uh, go back somehow to the um, to the issue of impunity. Uh, and I would uh, and I would try to see uh, two main points there. On the one hand, uh, there is a quote of something uh, they, they both come from Mexico. Uh, um, and I would. <laughs> Put it in other words, uh, what would be the guarantees if we try to go in a um, not transitional justice setting, but nevertheless a setting where we accept it is impossible to deal with everything? What would be the guarantees uh, uh, where we can say, okay, we can give that much up, but this is what is needed to avoid impunity? You know, the sentence forgive but not forget <laughs> is a slippery one. So what should we forgive and what should not we forget and what should we do nevertheless? On the other hand, uh, there is a point uh, raised by you when you say sometimes impunity is structural. It is guaranteed by the lack of functioning of the criminal uh, institutions. So when that is the case, uh, first of all, there is a different... Uh, kind of responsibility of the state, a different way to deal with that kind of systemic impunity? And second, would it be useful to join to the struggle beyond uh, uh, the working group, the Committee on Enforced Disappearance, other UN mechanisms uh, here in the questions mentioned was made to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of uh, Judges uh, and Lawyers. So how to sum up uh, to achieve the uh, aim of overcoming impunity. Now I will add my bit of question. Um, listening to you, I could not avoid thinking of uh, something that I read a few years ago. It was uh, a separate opinion uh, by Fabian Salvioli attached to uh, the views uh, um, of the Human Rights Committee on a case of enforced disappearance against Bosnia-Herzegovina. And there he <laughs> launched uh, I would say a, uh, a rather ose uh, interpretation of the obligation to investigate. Because what he said is, 
While the duty to investigate human rights violation and to bring perpetrators to justice is an obligation of means, okay, when we are dealing with enforced disappearances, the state has a duty to work the victim's family members to fully establish his or her uh, whereabouts. To put it more plainly, there is an obligation of results in those cases. Uh, otherwise, the cruel and inhuman treatment uh, of the disappeared persons uh, continues. Now, if we take this, and I would love to hear your, your uh, opinion on, on this, uh, and we enter into the um, scenario that we, you were depicting. So separation, search, investigation, two different institutions. So, very briefly, how do we go with something that Luciano already raised, uh, that is uh, mm, to obtain certain information from perpetrators, we might have to guarantee certain benefits. Will the two different institutions uh, uh, afterwards share that information? And do we agree that we can get off the hook some perpetrators in order to obtain that information? The floor is yours. <laughs> right now? Should I? Go ahead, Luciano. Okay, uh, just a, a, a few thoughts. Uh, I will try to be to be short to, to choose um, where to begin with prosecution. In a way, was uh, one of, of the questions I think, and this is uh, uh, very very interesting and, and important. And uh, my feeling is that the answer is begin where you can. I mean, when you are talking about uh, this um, impunity that, I mean, when you have uh, thousands and thousands of, of cases and you don't have one uh, conviction, I mean, you, you have to begin. Of course, as I said before, the easiest way, I think, is to, and, and this is the, mo the, the, the more legitimate way, is to begin with the with the superiors, with the head of of of, of those re uh, responsible, and it's easier because you can use uh, these uh, uh, legal tools that uh, don't uh, that allow you uh, to to uh, quite simple uh, prosecutions. And my feeling and the experience that I've seen in, in Argentina, I lived this this process in Argentina, is that this is uh, like a ball snow. I mean, it's it's growing, it, it grows. And once you begin uh, with accountability, it, it begins to, to build the, the sense in the community, in, in, in the public, uh, and, and that uh, this uh, thing that is so needed in these processes, that is uh, the, 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 the empathy to the victims, uh, you when when you have public trials uh, these be, began to be of course public and the information and the suffering of the victims begins to to appear in the newspapers on, on the television and so the the chances to 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 make the the process both of the prosecution but also of the search the the, the memory poli the policies all 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 the scheme uh, begins to grow so uh, my feeling, and this is something that, in, especially in Mexico, in, in our region, I always say, uh, is that there is a need to begin. I mean, if you don't begin, I mean, it's useless to have a very big plan for prosecution or to build uh, special units. You need to begin. You need convictions. You need cases. And then everything will, will grow. Of course, you will, you, you will need a strategy for that. Uh, when you have thousands of cases, is is quite difficult. But I mean, the, the the important thing is is to begin and to, of course, you will have to choose. And uh, but uh, the what was a flag in, in Argentina, and I and I think it was quite good. And the results are are, are seen. Is that uh, you will begin with a few cases, there will be more, and the idea is that. All the victims will have to to have uh, justice, and all the perpetrations will be prosecutors. Of course, at the end, 
some of them uh, of them will will die uh, you will not be successful with with all of them but i mean you can uh, have a plan uh, to uh, to prosecute everything of course you will have to uh, prioritize and the prioritization should uh, uh, should i think uh, begin with the easiest uh, thing and then, and then going to 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 the more uh, uh, complex um maybe Ryan I was to follow we have uh, uh, not not much time okay um yeah uh, just two minutes more um so I picked two uh, two issues first uh, following the pragmatic approach of uh, Luciano I would apply the same for what we have now in in those countries affected mostly by massive uh, disappearances that is when they have decided to create these extraordinary commissions outside of the judicial uh, system and uh, families and victims have put so much hope in them so let's support them let's support them by any means uh, we have but let's support them also in resolving this Thorny, thorny issue uh, uh, of cooperation with the judicial uh, system. And let's really criticize those uh, prosecutors that are not willing to comply with their obligation uh, to cooperate uh, with that uh, search uh, system when they're not doing it uh, by themselves. And the second uh, subject uh, <laughs> that makes me al almost uh, laugh uh, that you raised, uh, Gabriela, from uh, Fabian Savioli's uh, issue with uh, obligations of means and obligations uh, of result. That's the point where I'm really glad I'm not a lawyer because that is an issue uh, for me so above uh, all practical uh, considerations and makes, uh, at the end it comes to the same. Uh, if there is a clear principle that uh, the the search is a continuous obligation, then what sense does it make to define that as an obligation of means or of results? You have to continue until you find it. And if you don't find it, you have to continue. Uh, that's very simple. And uh, call it an, of means or of uh, results. You can't enforce a result uh, if it is impossible. What you have to judge is the goodwill, uh, the the professional uh, competence and the equipment to, to do your job uh, decently. Uh, and if you do that, for me, it's it's really a question that only lawyers can raise <laughs> if that is of means of, of, or of result. Sorry for that <laughs> to you, to both of you. Luciano, no, defend uh, the category, I, I, please. No, I, I, I fully agree with... Uh, with Ryan, I, actually, I, I was present uh, with uh, me too. Some, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the three of us uh, were in this kind of discussion before, and I, I think uh, there is no need. I mean, this is in a way a, a useless discussion. I mean, it, it is interesting, but it, practically, I, I I don't find uh, uh, really that the results will come uh, after the, the definition of one or, or the other. Um, of course, strengthening the the rights of the of the victims is always important. But I I think that uh, it, it's not a, a discussion uh, that uh, deserves a lot of energy, in, in, in my view. Well, I'm glad that it's 3:45 uh, because I would actually see a point uh, in qualifying it one or the other, in particular <laughs> if we are holding the state accountable. But since we are transitioning to the next panel where we are looking into individual responsibility, I will leave it at that, uh, although I would actually argue that I prefer to call it uh, of results rather than of means uh, because I do not want uh, an approach that, has, that is tick the box. I did this uh, and I'm off the hook also for states. I thank I, you very I, much I, for I your agree. contribution. I agree with you. I mean, that's important in, in, international, in international responsibility. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. And Eduardo, the floor is yours. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. One thing then that uh, Marcus mentioned yesterday, which is missing from this wonderful application that allowed us to, to meet, 
from all over the world is the applause because I'm sure that uh, in, in Corner 600 or at the university, we will receive at this point a wonderful applause for these wonderful panelists. And uh, I think it was a, an insightful discussion. Thank you very much for, for this to the three of you. It was, it was interesting to get to know the twins created by, by Gabriela, uh, female twins, which is even more interesting uh, at this point.